give a brief pre-introduction introduction. The Trail of Blood is a, a book written by uh, Dr. J.M. Carroll. It's a book that my, uh, my mentor, Dr. David C. Brown, um, highly recommended to me. So uh, there, in the books, in the books, you will see that there should be a, uh, an envelope here uh, the books cost $2. Um, I figure I would like over here, Bill, we have some over here too. Um, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to try to recruit half of the money that we spent on it. We'd ask you to put a dollar in the offering envelope, drop it off at the front desk. Um, when you leave tonight, um, that, uh, but like I said, h however many uh, books are upstairs for the youth group, and, and I'll go ahead and do this, even for their leaders, I'll pay for their leaders' books too. It's a privilege to do so. Um, just, and and uh, yeah, it's not a big deal, but we want to recoup these. These are given in our new members' packets. Uh, so if you uh, are a recent new member the last 10 years, you should have received, if not this exact booklet, then the smaller print pamphlets that we had. Um, but this is a good resource and a good explanation as to where God's people came from. So that being said, they're still handing those all out. Also, we have a... Uh, um, a quote. Were these handed out Yes, yet? All right. Um, now that you've gotten your books, uh, we have uh, approximately a hundred of these. A quote by C.H. Uh, uh, Spurgeon. Uh, let me talk a little bit about C.H. Spurgeon before we get started. Uh, boy, I, I want to tell you, I had a, hot, a lot more uh, energy and vigor until I threw my back out today. So young people, I promise I'm going to try and make this a lot more fun than tonight. Uh, but I just uh, I'm, a lot of my uh, a lot of the wind in my sails uh, is being eaten up by the distraction of pain. But please forgive me. We're going to try and get through this. And and again, hopefully this will be a good introduction to uh, to what should be it will, it will be an open ended series because I, just this quote alone right here could preach for probably three or four weeks. Let me tell you who Spurgeon was and how we are going to approach 
many of these groups throughout the last 2,000 years that would call themselves Christians. I've never met two people, let alone two Christians, that believed exactly the same on every single little thing. And uh, Spurgeon is called the Prince of Preachers, uh, the Lion of the Pulpit, if you will. Um, but he's also, uh, much to my chagrin, uh, a Calvinist. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, the, he, he makes Calvinism stand up on all fours, you know. And uh, he's probably the only Calvinist I've ever read uh, who um, eloquently woos my mind towards that doctrine. Calvinists uh, believe in predestination. They believe things that I don't believe in. They believe, and they have Scripture to back it up. Why do I bring this up? Well, I bring it up because I love Spurgeon. Spurgeon loved God. Spurgeon loved Jesus. Spurgeon's in heaven. But it's not because he's a Calvinist. Spurgeon's in heaven because of his faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, here, and in such, in such, we have this quote from him, uh, which didn't include uh, the second half, which I will, I will clumsily try to paraphrase. But before I read the quote, there's a couple things I'd like to, to give you, some misnomers. Uh, let's talk about why the series. Well, I've been wanting to do this series for a better part of 10 years, huh, Judy? Uh, I think it's come about now because um, it, things in my personal and private life have come to a head. And things within uh, Christianity as a whole throughout the world has come to a head. And I believe that the mystery religion, Babylon, will be calling all of her little bastard babies home. That's, a, that's an inflammatory statement. I know. Uh, Mystery Babylon uh, has not gone away. She has just clothed herself in the moniker of Christianity and called herself universal. And she seems universal, but she's not. Though she sits on many waters, she's not. No, I think it's important, and this is why I invited our youth and our youth team in here, because as time continues to funnel down to that great day of the Lord, we know, as we've been studying in First and Second Thessalonians, that the church will be raptured up before that great day comes. But it's going to come upon many, many religious people as a great surprise. It's going to come on upon many, many religious people, and many Christians uh, may well fall into deception at that last time. I do think God's grace will cover even the deception of bad doctrine. But know this, bad doctrine does not lead to the purity of belief. And Christ is the one who gave us our faith. Our faith is to be pure and unadulterated. But I don't think that all Baptists are going to heaven. The fact of the matter is, I don't think all Baptists are Christians. Do you know who Christians are? Followers of Jesus. So this word Baptist, in the first line of this quote by Spurgeon, I'm going I'm to swap it for Christian. We believe that the Christians are the original Baptists. We believe that the Christians are the original Baptists. Now, Spurgeon says he believes that the Baptists were the original Christians. But that kind of indicates that a ba Baptist is a denomination. And Baptist is not a denomination. And Christ, we're going to learn in the later parts of our study, Christ never named his church, unless you want to call them disciples. That's all he ever called them. Even uh, old, old Dr. Carroll here says he never gave a name to his ecclesia, 
again, you're going to hear these words ad nauseum. Young people, I'm going to keep repeating them until you can say it in your sleep. And then you're going to leave here one day and you're going to talk with a friend in another denomination. And they're going to tell you they're the one true church. And you're going to say, what does church mean? And they're going to say, well, you know. And you're going to be able to say, yes, it means the assembly. The called out assembly of the believers. But Jesus never gave a denominational name to his church. Unless you could say... He was when he titled John John the Baptist that those who followed John were Baptists as well. But as I said Sunday, even John the Baptist's disciples were rebaptized. So I do not believe personally that the Baptist Church has existed for two thousand years. Well, you know what I know is that Christ's church has existed for 2,000 years. Do you know how I know it? Because Christ's church is made up of Christians. And again, if there were a denomination, he would have just called them his disciples. So we believe that Christians were the original Baptists. We did not commence our existence. This is Spurgeon again. Existence at their formation, we were the reformers before Lutheran or Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome. Now that's important. The Church of Rome didn't exist until 330 A.D. Okay? Now, undoubtedly, Spurgeon says that Christians would never took part in the Church of Rome. I, I can't say that didactically, and I can't say that dogmatically. Because undoubtedly, there are Christians even to this day that are knee-deep, if not waist-deep, in false religions. So there was probably some Christians that got mixed up in this paganistic mystery religion called the Church of Rome. But he says, for we were never in it, but we have been an unbroken lineup to the apostles themselves. We don't believe in apostolic succession. We're going to get into that tonight. It's one of the tenets of what we know as the New Testament church. We do not believe in apostolic succession. However, the apostles were sent out and gave the good news. They gave the message. And every person that received it, well, they gave that message too. And on and on it went. We have always existed from the very days of Christ And our principles, Christian principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten, like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherents. Persecuted alike by the Romanists and Protestants of every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others. You go and, and, and hear this quote, you search it out. Look and see where Baptists have persecuted others for their, their religion, their faith. It's not in the history books, folks. Now, that's not to say Catholics weren't persecuted. Oh, the Catholics were persecuted terribly in England. And, and by the way, uh, uh, so were the Protestants uh, in, in Roman Catholic towns. They were persecuted as well. Ah, but the Baptists... Christians never persecuted anybody for their faith. So it goes on to say, uh, they were persecuted, uh, uh, believing, uh, excuse me, uh, holding Baptist principles, no government to hold Baptist principles, was persecuted others. Nor I believe any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the conscience of others under the control of man. Meaning, we do not believe in faith by coercion. See, we do not believe to conquer the soul with sword, might, and power. Instead, we give the good news. A Christian is not a Christian if they have been coerced into their belief. And here's another one for you. A Christian cannot be a Christian if their parents consecrated them into the belief as a babe. No, we believe that in the believer's confession, 
and the believer's baptism. It goes on to say, we have ever been ready to suffer as our martyrologies, uh, our martyrologies will prove, uh, but we are, not, we are not ready to accept help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with the government, and we will never make the church, although the queen, the despot over the consciences of men. I want you to bow with me as we pray. Father in heaven, greatest God Almighty, I just pray that you'll help me. As I told my wife today in your presence, preaching your word, Lord, is such a great joy to me. I have such great liberty in it and, and working with you. As I look into the work of other men, I pray that you'll help me to expound upon the truths that they express and expound upon them by the truth of your word. May your word illuminate that which has been expressed in this little book, Trail of Blood. And may your people grow, and especially our young people, Lord. May they come to an understanding that the world, the flesh, and the devil are very, very clever. And they have been teaching lies. For 2,000 years. Uh, may they see these things and begin to think critically as they grow. And as Brother Austin said last week, go into higher echelons of education, new halls of cultured and fancied people. And may they hold faith, true to the faith that has been given to them by your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. I mentioned the martyr, 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 easy for you to say, martyrologies, our martyrologies, that is, the Christian martyrologies. And this is one of the books that I, I brought out here before, man. I'll tell you, this thing is like a boat anchor. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of documented Christians killed because they would not renounce Jesus Christ and convert to another religion. Thousands upon thousands of Christians to this day being tortured, persecuted, and dying because they will not renounce Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation. Our martyrdom has been written down by those who hold fast to at least... a the majority of the 11 specific tenets that we're going to start looking into tonight. Tonight, the very first tenet of the New Testament church is that Jesus Christ is the head of that church. And He needs no proxy. He needs no interim. He needs no vicar to stand between He and His people. He, and He alone, is our intercessor. And as such, He is due all the praise, honor, and worship that many would bestow upon men and mankind within their institutional churches. That's my word for what we're going to learn in this book over these many, many weeks. Uh, Dr. Carroll calls irregular churches. If you have your book, would you please open to the back and unfold this little map this little map. What we're going to learn, oh man, I tell you what, let me just praise God for Bill Hughes. I love Bill. He, Bill's like Batman. He always has all these wonderful toys. So uh, here you're going to see in the back of your book, right, the same thing that we have on display here. And I want to thank God for Judy and Lana who got this done and, and put it up today. And, and what you're going to find is that this, these, these circles, these black circles that I'm circling with my lasers, these are what are relegated as irregular churches, irregular assemblies, meaning that at, at, at within the first hundred years of Jesus' uh, 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 institute, or not, uh, 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 manifestation, of his church, calling of his people, saving of his bride, 
In the first hundred years here, you see we have a black dot. And this black dot means that they began off into error. And that error, that error could be anything uh, from a- anything that diverts from the 11 tenets that we're going to be talking about and applying to the New Testament church. That's a very important uh, title you need to know. Desert Hills Baptist Church, if we were anything else, called anything else, I would answer to New Testament Church. Okay? So what you see is these churches went into error. That's not to mean that they weren't successful. They were extremely successful. But one of the things that they did in going into error is they went away from Scripture being the authority and instead assumed the authority, some would say usurped the authority, of God's Word and Jesus Christ. And they did so based upon some, a couple of the verses in the Scripture that I had Brother Richard read tonight. All right, let's put this away for now. Let's look into the Bible. The Bible is, uh, we're going to call the trail of blood our diving board, and we're going to call the Bible the pool that we jump in. Amen? The Bible is the authority. The Bible is the authority. Here in Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, we see Jesus in Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. With his disciples. Remember, he called them disciples. He did not call them Baptists. He did not call them Presbyterian. He did not call them Anglican. He called them disciples. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus wasn't afraid to probe people's thoughts. And and I don't think we should be shy in learning how to think. Let's park there for one second. We have a glut, a drought, really, of critical thinking in our nation. We have a drought of critical thinking in our churches. Who here has ever heard of fossil fuel before? Fossil fuels. We're all trying to get rid of it. It's making the, da- the, making the planet dirty, you know. Uh, fossil fuels are, are, are titled such because the theory... The theory is that oil comes from dinosaurs. I mean, everybody here thinks that, right? We, that's what we were thought. That's what we were taught, isn't it? Fossil fuels, and we're, we're told that that we're told that that oil is a finite substance. Yet it's it's the uh, third. It's the second most prevalent liquid on the planet only second to water, and it's the third most prevalent uh, thing on the planet, if you will, behind silica and water. But we're told that all of that oil comes from dinosaurs. That's why it's called fossil fuels. But what we're not told is this, is that the fossil record has only shown to be complete down to 16,000 feet from wherever you start to drill. And we're not told that you really hardly ever strike oil till you get to 30,000 or 33,000 feet. And if you were told that, I can almost guarantee you've never been told that there has not been a single fossil ever found past 16,000 feet in the Earth's crust. And yet... We would all say that we fill our cars up with the fossil fuel. Now, you want to believe that oil comes from dinosaurs? I don't care what you believe, and I don't care what you think, but I do desperately care about what our young people, how our young people think. I, I, I care desperately for our young people and our young families that they might look and, and think on things with a more critical eye. I certainly hope that everybody here is pulling out their, their cell phones and fact-checking me on that. You know. 
Something else about the fossil fuels before we move forward? Do you know it's never been duplicated in a double-blind study? Never, not one time. But we gobble this garbage down because we go to our temples of higher learning, and it's in a book. And somebody who's got a paper behind their name, possibly a DR period, you know, one of those PhDs, tells us that they're right. And if you want to have a paper like they have, you've got to at least put it down on, on your paper that you understand the concept. We must think critically. We must think critically. Who is the head of the church? Who is the founder of Christianity? And, and who is it that the Christian answers to? Do you answer to the pastor? God forbid! You don't answer to me except for that which goes on in the church. Yes. Your private life, though? My, men, all ministry must be authorized. You want a pastor or a bishop, an overseer, a, a council? You must authorize that unless what you're doing jeopardizes someone or something that's going on within the body. But here we see in Matthew chapter 16 that Jesus asked them, who do men say that the Son of Man am? And, that, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And I go back to this, young people, who do you say Jesus is? He's the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. And he is either the head of the church or he's not. So how is it that we got off? How is it that these irregular churches, these institutional churches, got off? Well, once again, they did not go to the Scriptures as their authority. Now, I can give them a little bit of leeway there because, let's face it, we didn't have the canonized Scripture that we have today uh, in the first hundred possibly even 500 years. Ah, but now we have the canonized Scripture, so we ought to be able to tell per Scripture, because it is the Word of God, and if it's not the Word of God, we're all messed up. You can add to take away from it as you want, and where are we? But the blind leading the blind. But he says, uh, Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not uh, revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, circle Peter, circle Peter. You might want to bring your highlighters and your pens and pencils. I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, circle rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Peter, in the Greek, is Petros. Petros. Same with, uh, it, but this Petros is the same as the word Cephas. Turn with me to uh, the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 42. John, chapter 1, and verse 42. And Jesus, and, and he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, which is Barjona, Simon Barjona. Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas. Cephas is an Aramaic word f translated Petros in the Greek. Cephas means rock. More specifically, a rock that has been separated from a greater, uh, uh, a greater stone. Technically, Cephas means pebble. Pebble. So when, when Jesus says, Thou art Peter, he says, Thou art a pebble, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Two words. Petros, coming from Cephas, the Aramaic word, meaning 
small stone or pebble. I like to think of them as a river rock. Uh, uh, certainly, Peter had his rough edges taken off by a lifetime of faith. And I think Jesus knew that, and that's why he renamed him and, and called him Cephas or Peter. And, and in such, he says, Thou art a pebble, Peter. You are a rock, but upon this Petra, Petra, coming from the Greek, meaning boulder, mountainous, or even foundational. Two different words, right, that have equivocal, uh, uh, that are sound alike, but they have equivocal meanings. You, a rock is not just a rock. A stone is not just a stone. And Peter was a pebble, a small rock, yet Christ is the mountain and foundation of our faith. Turn back with me, if you will, to Matthew again. Matthew. He says, Blessed art thou, verse, uh, uh, chapter 16, verse 16, uh, 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Petros, and upon this Petra I will build my ecclesia. Ecclesia. Now, if the church, if the church, the ecclesia, started here, where, where the Catholics say it started, in about 300, 330, between 340 and 300 and 400 A.D., then where was it all these years? you telling me that Jesus Christ would build something and uh, it would fall away for 330 years? No. That's silly. How do I know it's silly? Because, well, the book of Acts says they were first called Christians at Antioch. And guess what they did at Antioch? They worshipped God at Antioch. And they promoted Jesus Christ. And because of that, they were called Christians. Which, by the way, every denomination that Christians have been called from the beginning has been a slur against God's people and His Son, Jesus Christ. They were called Christians first at Antioch, not because of how pious they were. It was a slur. It was a slur. And a euphemism, if you will, for idiots. They have a, um, I showed it here one time, and God have mercy, when a couple of our members, they just clutched their pearls. They couldn't believe it. But they have found graffiti, ancient graffiti, that depicts uh, someone uh, on, a cruci on a cross, crucified, with an ass's head. And in the translation in, of the graffiti written beneath it, it says, so-and-so's God is an ass. That's what they thought of Christians. Why? Well, there's no power in death, is there? Well, there is if you raise again from the dead. You see? So I'm, what I'm getting at is this, is that all throughout antiquity, Christians have been slurred with nicknames. See, we don't call ourselves Baptists. We were called Anabaptists, which means to rebaptize. And why were we called Anabaptists and hunted down like dogs? Well, it's because we would not accept people into our congreg congregations who had not made a profession of faith and been baptized through believers' baptism. The first tenets, some of the first tenets, of the New Testament church. So they said those stinking Anabaptists hunted, killed, persecuted, ran down. No, here Jesus says, I will build my ecclesia and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now most good Baptist preachers just stop there because they don't want to get into the controversy of verse 19. It says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt, uh, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth 
shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And that verse taken out of context almost sounds like Jesus has given the power of salvation to Peter. But you know what? If Peter had the keys to heaven and hell, life and death, and if heaven was given, if Peter was given all this authority, my question is, where are the keys? And what are the keys? See, we must think critically about these things. There's two master keys. Two master keys. You ready? Say amen. amen. These poor kids up there, they're probably bored to tears. I promise next week, more caffeine, less pain. <laughs> Listen, there are two master keys, and yet there are four other keys. The two master keys start first with the Old Testament. Remember when the, the, the uh, Lazarus, the story of the Lazarus and the rich man, and the rich man cried out to Abraham and said, Abraham, please send Lazarus to warn my brothers. Warn my brothers about this terrible place where I'm at. And he says, uh, you know what? They've got Moses and the, and the law. They know salvation can be found in the Old Testament. Uh, many uh, Baptist preachers said this, the Old Testament is Jesus Christ concealed. The New Testament is Jesus Christ revealed. But salvation can be found in the Old Testament if you're looking for God. So even though, even though these irregular churches did not have a canon, a canon of Scripture, uh, meaning Matthew through Revelation... Jesus Christ revealed, they did have the Old Testament. And in such, the Old Testament is the first of the master keys. The New Testament is the second of the master keys to heaven and hell. But the four, four specific keys, anybody want to guess on what those are? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When he gave them the keys, what he was saying was, your life, your testimony, our three-year ministerial journey is going, are going to be the four keys to salvation. The four keys. To, and, and, and any one of them will do to be saved if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If, by the wooing of the Holy Spirit, you become convicted of your sins and you confess Him as your Lord and Savior, believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you too can be saved. Ah, but see, that's not what the irregular institutional churches skewed off to do and say. Instead, they say, well, you know, we don't know. We don't, we don't, and again, I'm giving you a broad overview. We're going to get into greater depth in this much later on. It's a small book, but it's a good series. They said, we don't want our ba ba baby's low mortality rate. You know, they said the average age of, of people at this time was between 25, 35 years old in the first 100 years, first 100 years A.D., why? Well, it wasn't because people didn't live to 75. It's because most people died at birth. And if the child didn't die, many women died at birth, giving birth. And if they didn't die giving birth because of a lack of medical supplies, antibiotics, proper medical treatment, many of them died of infection. So what did they do? Well, they, they, they came along and they decided they were going to help God. They're going to help God. And what they were going to do is they're going to baptize their babies quickly. And that way, if they died, they would go to heaven. Can I tell Let's stop there for a second. Because I certainly don't want you to leave here thinking that if a baby dies, he goes to hell. When, when an infant dies... <clears throat> When an infant dies, it is immediately in the presence of God. Why? Well, not because it wasn't born. It was born without a sinful nature. We are all born with a sinful nature. However, it is innocent. It is innocent. 
not knowing right from wrong. God never sends anyone or rejects anyone who is innocent. No, it says that I'll give you the keys of heaven and earth, and whatsoever you bind on earth, it will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. How is it that we bind, and how is it that we loose? It's interesting to me, Jesus Christ came into the synagogue one day, and he, he began to read out of one of the Old Testament books. And it began to say uh, how he would come to preach the good news, and he would set the captive free. And upon reading that particular section of that Old Testament book, he shut the book before it finished. And he says, I tell you, this day that prophecy has been fulfilled. The keys are the scriptures, the Old and New Testament. The four keys, the four skeleton keys, if you will, that'll get you in. It doesn't matter which one you use. They'll all get you in if you're convicted and receive Jesus Christ are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But know this, Jesus Christ is the door. See? No one gets in except by Him. And the only way to get in by Him is by faith and not through the repetition of ritual that you will find in the last 2,000 years of history. What you will find, and you will see this quote in the book, in all of the red dots here throughout history, is though that there are some tenets and even beliefs that these Christian churches did not hold uh, in, in unity or in one accord, the 11 tenets that we are going to look at first on page number, page number 5, they held to these 11 tenets and had them in common as a whole. Again, not believing exactly the same even as we do today. But as I mentioned at the beginning of our study this evening, I love Charles Spurgeon. He is the prince of pe preachers, the lion of the sultry. But he's a Calvinist, and I just am not a Calvinist. I don't believe in that. But I will tell you this. More than likely, John Calvin's in heaven too, you know? So let's look here on, on page 5, and then we're going to close with this. We'll close uh, reading Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 13 through 18 and 19. But the first tenet that marks a New Testament church is its head and founder is Christ. You're going to want to highlight that. Its head and founder is Christ. And what does that mean? He is the lawgiver, and the church is the only executive. The church. The church is the only executive of his laws. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, and we will try to draw to a close. Colossians chapter 1, excuse me, verses, um, let's go verse... 12 through 18. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Who is us? Is it Baptists? It's Christians. There were no Baptists at this time. They're Christians. They're the Colossian Christians. Hence, they are the ecclesia, the church at Colossia, at Colossia, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. How are we forgiven of sins? By the absolution of priests, right? We are, we, are, we are redeemed through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We have forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every, of every creature. For by Him were all things created. How were all things created? By Jesus. 
By Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and what? For him. If all things were created by him and all things were created for him, do you not think that he would protect his ecclesia? He said, I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. And he, Jesus, is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he, Jesus, is what? The head of the body, the Episcopalians. The Presbyterians? Well, see, if you believe in a universal church, then he's the head of those churches too. No, he is the head of the body of the ecclesia, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might be preeminent. Now, before we, we close, I'm going I'm to be naming all these denominations. I will tell you this. Um, you can logic... In your critical thinking, young people, are you listening up there? Say amen just to, pl just to placate me. Young people, when you are thinking logically, when you are thinking critical, here's something key that you need to take away from you, from tonight. You cannot logically prove a universal negative. Do you know what that means? A universal negative says there are no green porn ponies on the moon with yellow ears and a unicorn. Well, I guess you could prove that if you could be everywhere, all the time, on the moon, all the time. But you can't. So you can't prove an, a universal negative. So I cannot say dogmatically that there are no Christians in the Presbyterian Church. I cannot say that there are no Christians in the Anglican Church. I cannot say that there are no Christians in the Catholic Church. What I can say dogmatically, though, is that much of their beliefs and their rituals are paganistic in their origin, and their doctrines are false. Why? Well, as the great reformer himself, who I love, however, I do not I part ways with Martin Luther because he still believed in infant baptism and killed many, many, many Anabaptists. He is the one who came and said, Solo Scriptura. Scripture alone. And if we go by Scripture alone, there's not a baby baptized in the New Testament. None. Only those who made a believer's confession, and those who, who were baptized were baptized in the presence of the ecclesia. And just for good measure, they weren't sprinkled. They were immersed, showing the death, burial, and resurrection of their Lord and their Savior, the head of the church, Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you're a guest, I want to thank you for coming. I want to beg you, keep coming back. I, I, I will tell you right now, young people, please forgive me. I'm a much better preacher than I am a teacher. I, I, I like just preaching and getting into the heat of it, you know. But please, please keep coming. Please take your books home and, and read them. And, and, and circle things that you want questions about that you have questions about. And you can email Judy. She'll get me the, the questions, and I'll answer them as best I can. If not from the pulpit, then I'll send you back another email. All my emails go through Judy. That way she gets to read all the hate mail, you know. <laughs> Tonight, again, is just a, an introduction, if you will, and an overview uh, of what we're going to be looking at. But the first tenet of a New Testament church that began with Jesus Christ here, in the first hundred years of what's called the common era, is Jesus. And he, he established it by first giving them apostles and preachers and teachers. 
It didn't get started even at Pentecost. He started it while he was still here. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are not just absent of salvation. You are outside of his body. A a body is such that it is incorporated. Kidneys don't go floating around doing their own thing. Hearts, lungs, toes and toenails don't even separate lest they get smashed. And then by the grace of God, maybe you grow one back. But if you are a born-again Christian, you are incorporated into the body of Christ. And he is, the, he is manifested in our presence even as two or more gathered in his name. If you don't have Jesus Christ, what body is it that you claim? 